Uh, Luke chapter 4, let's, let's start in verse 1. It says, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness and being tempted forty days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing, and afterwards, when he had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil, taking him up to a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you, and all their glory. And this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all of this will be yours. Jesus answered and said to him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall, not, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Amen. So it's an interesting interaction because you have Satan uh, coming to Jesus and, and tempting him. And he, he, he says, you know, if you are the son of God, I mean, he, he, he knows he is and he's tempting him. And um, uh, so you have uh, Satan tempting his, his own creator when you, when you back up from it, right? And you look at it. Uh, and what I really want to highlight is verse 5 and 6 and 7 and 8. It says, uh, then Jesus, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. So he shows him all of the various kingdoms of the world. The Roman, right at that point, what would, Roman would, Rome would be one, right? You'd, you'd have Egypt, you'd have other kingdoms around the world. And so Satan shows him all of these kingdoms. And Satan says to him, all of this authority, in other words, all of the authority that I have in controlling these different kingdoms around the world, I will give that to you. And the glory of them, in other words, the splendor of Rome, the glory of Rome, the power of Rome, known you know, throughout the earth as a conqueror, right? As, as something that, that controlled the entire civilized world, even though there were other, other kingdoms, they all submitted to Rome, right? And so he says, I'll give you the glory in those. Then he goes on to say, this has been delivered to me. So I have control of this. And I can give this to whoever I want to. Think about that. I want you to try and absorb this to understand that, you know, Satan's tempting him with the word but he, he, he says it's delivered to me, even though God created it. God's creation has been delivered to me so that I can function in it and, and I can control parts of it and I can do with it whatever I want to do with it. So we have this fallen being controlling what God has created, right? And I, I like to look at this as a lease because we'll see, because he's fallen, eventually he's going to lose this lease, and eventually he's going to be judged, right? And so, but the Bible calls him the God of this world. Even after the resurrection, if you just hold your finger here and go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Second Corinthians chapter four. In verse three, it says, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who perish, whose minds the God of this world or the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, least the light of the glorious gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God should shine unto them. So, the Bible itself, after the resurrection, still calls him the God of this age, the God of this world, right? And so what, what is a God? Who is, what, is, what is the definition of God, okay? And you go, if you go to uh, Webster's and you just look up God, uh, it basically says it's the supreme being who created everything, right? And who, who, uh, con who controls everything, 
right? Everything is his. He, God is the supreme being who created everything and controls everything. Okay, then the second definition is little g, right? It's somebody, it's, it's somebody who presides over the worldly affairs and the things that God created. It's right in Webster's, little g, second definition, right? So Satan became the God of this world. He, in other words, when, when you look at it, and we're going to look at it, God created, restored the world and gave man, essentially, to have dominion over his creation. Okay? And then as a result of the fall, Satan took a position as the God of this world. So when you, when you look at you know, uh, Luke chapter 4, the devil, he's not, he's, you know, Jesus didn't challenge him on the authority he had. Because he, he basically said, in verse 6, the devil said to him, all this authority, in other words, I have this authority, I will give the authority to you, I'll transfer it to you. All of the glory of these kingdoms, I will transfer them to you. Because it's been delivered to me and to whomsoever I want to give it. And so when you back up and look at this, and I'm, we're going to try and look at the big picture because I want you to see, I want you to understand our position, okay? Because when you look back in history, uh, and let's do that. Go to Daniel chapter 2. When you look back in history, sometimes we have a distorted view of what's really going on. And by understanding it, we'll understand what we're walking into and, and what the real truth is of the matter. But go to Daniel chapter 2. And God gives Nebuchadnezzar a dream about five kingdoms. Okay, there are seven total kingdoms that are, are illustrated in the Bible as being a, a part of Antichrist, a part of Satan's regime, right? In other words, uh, uh, there are seven. The two prior to Babylon are Egypt and Assyria. Okay, then when we come in to the time that we're talking about in Daniel, we have the Babylonian Empire. And then the Babylonians... We have the Medo-Persian Empire that comes next. And then we have the Greeks. And then we have the Romans. And then we have the final kingdom of Antichrist. So we're going we're gonna to look at five different kingdoms. And I, wa I want to talk about them with you just a little bit. Uh, so Daniel chapter 2, verse 36. In a dream, now we will tell you the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the fields, or the birds of heaven, he has given them into your hands and has made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. Okay, now the first obvious thing to see is that nobody gets their kingdom without God agreeing to it. Even Antichrist. In Revelations it says, and it was given to him for 42 months or for, for, for uh, time, time, and half a time or three and a half years, which means God has, okay, said it's yours, right? So here Nebuchadnezzar is the, the head of gold. You know, Daniel sees this image. So we're going to become less and less valuable and less and less desired as we go. So the head of gold was the most glorious of the kingdoms, okay? And he controlled the whole earth at that time. So he's the head of gold. He said, but after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another and a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule all of the earth, and a fourth kingdom that will be strong as iron, and so much as iron breaks to pieces and shatters everything. And like iron, it, is, it crushes kingdoms and will break them into pieces. 
And whereas you saw the feet and the toes that were partly clay and partly iron, a kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of iron shall be in it. Just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay, and the toes of the feet, which are partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile, and you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle themselves with the seed of men, and they will not adhere one to another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of that king, or those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the, the kingdom shall be left to other people. It shall break it to pieces and consume all of the kingdoms. It shall stand forever. So, so just let me go through this just historically. So you have the Egyptian empire, you have the Assyrian empire, you have the Babylonian empire, the head of gold, you have the Medo-Persian empire, which is the breastplate, I think, of silver. I'm not sure, silver, I think. Then you have the, the midsection of bronze, which is the Greek empire. Then you have the legs of iron, right? And then you have feet, part iron and part clay, okay? So the interesting thing of these empires, I mean, when you look at them from a historical standpoint, they were great societies. They had innovation in them. They had, we don't know how the Egyptians built the, the pyramids, right? We still don't, we, we don't know how they did it without, you know, mechanics and, and, and engineering. And I mean, everything is, is uh, appropriately placed. So uh, even on the compass, on, I mean, they, they knew true north, right? And they built all of these things, you know, before Babylon. And then one of the great uh, world wonders was the Babylonian gardens, right, of the ancient of the ancient times. So we have these great societies that all had a middle class. They all built a middle class. They all had a thriving society. I mean, I've, I've been to Rome. I've seen they had bathhouses and they engineered water and aqueducts and they had running plumbing. They had, you know, it, 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 these, are, these are great societies that had risen up. They had built middle classes so that the people had lots of freedoms. Now, and all of them were a little bit different, but Rome, there was freedom of religion for years. It was a democracy. It's very similar to the US until leadership fell into the hands of one man. And that's characteristic of all of these kingdoms. They all became uh, uh, run, right, managed. All of the authority resided in one man. It was Caesar, it was Pharaoh, it was a king. And that king was thought to be part deity and even brought worship to himself, all of them. Hail Caesar, right? So when you look historically, when you, when you, when you get an image of Satan, he built these societies. He, he, you know, we get this image that he wants... Everybody broke and, you know, and, and living in, in black magic and voodoo somewhere in Haiti? <laughs> no. He wants to be a successful God. And there's another characteristic in all of these kingdoms. They persecuted God's people. Every one of them. Every single one of them were great societies. They had, I mean, I, I, I made several notes. They had, they, they had uh, a lot of prosperity. There were a lot of protections. They were known around the world. They fed other, other countries. And, and uh, they, you know, they, they, they had rights. I mean, Rome had rights. Paul stood on the rights of being a Roman citizen in the book of Acts, right? But they all, every single one of them, came against God's covenant people. It's, it, they were isolated as that as people that they persecuted. Every single one of them brought the, the covenant people, God's covenant people, into bondage and into slavery. And every single one of them did great things. Every single kingdom did. There's a very interesting scripture we read over. If you look at verse 43, as I saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, 
and they mingle themselves with the seed of men. Why would that be there? What's the, why would that be there? So let me explain the toes. The to, we, have, we have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greek, Rome, and then the future kingdom, the kingdom that we're looking for, it's the last kingdom, right? It's part iron, so we can assume it's part of what was Rome, right? Same material and part of clay. And so it'll be the most inferior kingdom ever. In other words, of all of the other ones that came before it, it's the least valuable. It's the least glorious. And this is the Antichrist kingdom that we may live under, or certainly our kids or grandkids will. Okay? And so there's some, I believe, that, there's, that, that in all of these Antichrist situations, because they're all known as Antichrist, when you go to Revelations, there's one beast, Revelations 13, with seven heads. That's the seven kingdoms. Six are and have fallen, and one is yet to come. But they're all a part of the same beast. They all function as the same. You see, do, you, do you guys see that? And so when we, when we look at Satan and the authority he has, the least that he has on the earth as the God of this earth, it all is because of the least that God gave him. And I don't know all the mechanics of it, but God bestowed on him the authority to build these kingdoms and that these kingdoms would persecute his people. You guys see that? So he can, um, from a, from a management standpoint, we're in his backyard. We live in his world. It's his world, right? Who owns it? God does. Who has care, custody, control, as the Bible, as the dictionary would say, presides over the worldly affairs and the things of the earth? Satan does. Okay? Now, let's go to Genesis and let's look at us. So Genesis, let's look at chapter 1 first. Verse 26, it says, Then God said, Let us, the Trinity, make man in our image. The, what is the image of God? A living spirit, right? According to our likeness. In other words, we, we look like the God that created us. Let them have, who's them? Creation. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, and over all of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created he them. He them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So God gives man the earth that he restores. And he makes him the ruler over this. Okay? In chapter 2, in verse 15, it says, Then the Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to tend it and to keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may eat freely. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat, you shall surely die. Or literally it says die twice. In dying you'll die, or by a first death you'll experience the second death, which we know they died spiritually and then they died physically, right? So verse chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Is that a lie? It's not a lie. He's asking a question. Has God said, You can eat, you, you shall not eat freely? In other words, you shall not eat freely of all the trees. So he knows the commandments there, right? 
And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. She speaks something that's not true. God didn't say anything about touching it. He said, if you eat it, you'll die. So Adam added this, because she was not created in uh, Genesis chapter 2 when the command came. She came after. So her learning came from Adam. Okay, then the serpent said, you shall not surely die. Okay, that's a complete lie, right? What does that lie do? It says there's no consequence to your action. You can do what you want. You can, you can disobey God and not worry about the consequences. You can live and, and abuse his creation against his rules, right? And there won't be any consequence to you for you in doing that. That's a complete lie, okay? For God knows that in the day that you eat, your eyes will be open and you will be what? Like God, knowing good and evil. So we know the woman saw that the tree was good for food. It's pleasant to the eye. Treated to be desired to make one wise. She took the fruit, ate. She gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. The eyes of them both were open. They knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together. They made themselves coverings. Okay, let's, let's look at what happened. Let's, yeah, we have to look at what happened, okay? So God creates, restores the earth and gives man dominion over it. So he has complete and total control over the work of God's hands. So the supreme being that created everything and ruled everything said, you, I'm giving this to you for your enjoyment and your rulership. So, but here's the thing. You don't eat of this one tree. Satan comes in and tells them there is no consequence to you abusing the creator's creation. You can do what you want. There's no consequences to it. In fact, if you do it, you'll be a god. You'll be, small g, a god. But he knows that what? When they fall, right? Just like he fell, they're going to be a small g, and they're going to be judged. He knows that. Okay? So what he does, his agenda, is to get man to become his own God. To get man to use God's creation the way he wants to use God's creation. And, and so what we see here is we see two categories of creation. Satan and angels and man both fall, but both now are a type of God in that they're making their own rules and doing whatever they want to do separate from the true God. And they have no living relationship with the true God. Do you guys see that? So when you, when you look at it, when you look at the, at the scripture, you know, Satan gets them to fall. There's no consequence from the ruler or the creator. You, now fallen man will be like God making decisions. The key is he's falling and he's going to act like God. He's going to preside over God's affairs in the world, the creation of, of God in the world. And so he's going to live a life that's separate from God. Do you guys see that? And so we can do whatever we want in the earth today. Right? I mean, we can do, we can change things. We can do things. We can modify things. But God is not our God, our, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and our Father, right? Because we're believers. We believe that he is God, and we're not God anymore. Do you, do you, do you see that? Do you understand that? So either God's your God, or you, your, you are your God. Okay? And you make your own decisions. And you, you decide what's right and wrong. And you, you live in this, in this earth without regard to God. You, 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 and, and, and so when we look at the big picture, we look at 
a, a little over 7 billion human beings on the face of the earth, a vast majority of which think they are God and have separated themselves, right? In fact, if you go to Ephesians, let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 1, it says, And you he made alive who were dead in your trespasses and sins. Who's he talking to? The Ephesian church, uh, to us, believers. He says, In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Well, who's that? Who runs the course of this world? The two groups of fallen, the fallen Satan in his demonic realm and fallen man, right? And let me read it again. In which we once walked according to the course of this world, which is written by fallen man and, and fallen angels, according to the prince of the power there, that's Satan, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all, all of us, all of humanity once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. What is the children of wrath? The children of God's judgment. The children of God's judgment. Okay, so, so we see here that fallen creation, acting as God, using God's creation, disregarding living in sin, but eventually will be judged. So we have that, right? So let's look at, uh, go over to Romans chapter 1. Let's look at how this, this separation occurs between us and them. And here, here's where we're going with this. We are steamrolling into Antichrist's kingdom. We are moving every day closer and closer to a point where we're going to be the feet of clay and iron and, and, and there's going to be world dominance by Antichrist. We're moving there every day. Every day you wake up, we're one day closer. Okay? And we're, we're in that realm. We're in that time period. I mean, whether it's our, ours collectively here or our children we're not going to go another 100 years like this. We're not going to go another 50 years like this. We are rolling in. And so what I want you to see is what we're encountering, but more importantly, what the root of it is, so that you can know in your heart you're on the right side. You're on the right side. So here in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation... For everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also to the Greeks. Okay, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, which is what? The coming of Jesus Christ, his birth, his life, his passion, his death, his resurrection, right? God's plan of salvation. But what does salvation mean? Salvation means being saved from impending danger. Being saved from judgment. In other words, the humans that we're talking about that are gods, right, that are walking around as the god of their own world, selfish, their own self-ambition, living without disre disregard completely to God, they are living their lives until, right, the lights go on and they possibly make a decision to be saved, which is to make God their god again, okay? So it's the gospel that brings the salvation to everyone to the Jew first and also the Greeks. Now he's going to go through the two groups and begin to explain, uh, and to try and understand how the fallen group looks at creation, what we just talked about. He says, For in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just or the saved or the redeemed shall live by faith. So faith in who? A living God. Amen? That's, that's us. That's one group. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against the ungodly 
those that don't live according to God's rules, unrighteous men, which are what? Not in right standing with the God, the creator, who suppress the truth, who suppress the word of God in unrighteousness. So we, we, now we have the second group, this group that is fallen, this group that is separate, this group that, that it dominates the earth and dominates most cultures. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. Well, who's them? The unsaved. Okay? Here's what he's shown them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. Here's what that means. And this is, this is critical to understand. By looking at creation, all of the things that are in creation, it should be clearly understood that it was done by intelligent design. It didn't happen by accident. It's impossible. It's impossible to happen by accident. So here's what God is standing on. That I don't care if you didn't have the gospel preached to you. I don't care where you live on the face of the earth. If you're fallen, there's a chance for you to believe I exist. Because it's clearly seen by the work of my hand. Right? So now he's specifically talking to the ungodly, the unrighteous, and the people that suppress the truth. Very important. The people that are on the other side of God in our country on political issues are suppressing the truth. This will be their guilt when they stand before God. And, and it goes on to say why. But do you guys see the big picture? God's saying, listen, I made all of this, so it's clearly seen. And when we came here, when settlers came here from Europe, they were worshiping a creator, a deity. When they went to South America, they were worshiping a creator, a deity. When you went to Africa, in the depths of Africa, they were worshiping. So it's inherent in us naturally to believe there's a God. There's a God. But he's talking about this, un because in verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against ungodliness, unrighteousness, that means men that are unrighteous in the eyes of God, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. In other words, they hold it back. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to look at it. You ever see, did you see the thing in Times Square la last week or where they showed the abortion, right? They showed the womb, right? Everybody's chanting and has picket signs until it goes on and then they all walked away. Because you can't deny it's not a living being in the womb. You know, you know what I'm saying? It's just like the truth is the truth. You want to suppress it and be a complete imbecile, go ahead. But the truth is the truth. It's a living being in the womb. It's alive. It has hands, heartbeat, right? So they're all picketing, and then they show it on the big Times Square uh, TV, and then all of them in one accord walked away. It was, it, was, it was crazy. Because what do you do? How do you fight that? I mean, nobody, they don't want to look at a partial, nobody wants to look at a partial birth abortion. You got people who want, who want to say, yes, do it. Go ahead and do it. Yes, we agree with it. It's a woman's body, but they don't want to watch it. They don't want to watch it. Why? Because they can see the killing of a life. And, and that, you know, makes me ill. But I'm sure when God looks at it, he says, you're going to stand before me one day with your nonsense. Okay, so this is the group he's talking about. He said, uh, verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, they're without excuse. Now here's what he says. Because although they knew God, although they know there is a God, although they know there is a supreme being who created everything and has rule over everything and makes the rules, they did not glorify him as God. God. In other words, yeah, is there a God? Yes, there's a God. Do you live according to that God? Because he created you. No, I don't live that way. I live the way I want to live. 
Do you guys see that? Neither are un unthankful for what? For life itself, for earth, for a place to live. Became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became what? Fools. And changed the glory of the incorruptible God into images made like corruptible man and birds and four-fetted animals and creepy things. In other words, they changed who God was into something God created. They changed who God was into something that God created. And this can be even a man. This could be Muhammad. This could be Buddha, right? They changed the incorruptible God into something that man created. Therefore, God, the supreme being, also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Circle it, underline it. They changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. You cannot do verse 25 and believe in the true God because you worship yourself. Men worship themselves. By having pride, you worship yourself. By being selfish and self-serving, you worship yourself. Do you, you, you see? The, it's the opposite of love. So Jesus comes on the scene. It says, put others above yourself, right? Don't look on your own things, but look on their things. Try and help each other, feed each other. What, what are they saying? He's saying, don't be selfish with what you have. Be giving with what you have. Share with what you have. You follow? You see the two opposing definitions of God and what God is supposed to do? It says, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use of what is against nature. Likewise, also men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one for another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the, 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 uh, their error which was due, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, they listen, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. So now here we have, I want you to see this, because this, this, this pulls the fallen angels, right? Satan and his group, along with fallen man, this is how they are treating the creation that God gave them. They're changing the rules. I mean, God said, here's man, here's woman, here's sex, here's marriage. Right? They take those rules and completely change them around so everything is perverted. And have joy and happiness in doing it. Now, what is that? That's acting as a God. That's acting as, small g, a God. That's them taking our society and completely scuttling what the true God and creator has set up and institutionalized as the way his creation should function and operate in the family unit. Okay? This tells me how close we are to the Antichrist kingdom. Because in the last 10 years, this has exponentially increased. On TV programs, you can't see a commercial anymore. And, and nobody cares about the God. Nobody cares about the true God. Okay? Here's what God goes on to say. It says, being filled with all unrighteousness and sexual immorality and wickedness and covetousness and maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-minded. They are whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, 
who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also prove those who practice them. Okay, so, so when you back up from this and you start looking at where are we today? You know, today's date, where are we? We are in a society that is moving at a rapid pace to rewriting the laws that God has over his creation. Okay? So we have made God our God and his word our truth to live by, right? But they are living life according to whatever they want to do with a complete disregard for God. In here it says three or four times, it says, it says they didn't glorify him as God. It says they didn't like to retain the knowledge of God. It says they changed the truth of God into a lie. It says they changed the glory of God into something that was man-made. So it, it's clear that when, you, when the Holy Spirit's giving this to Paul, he's saying, here's what they're doing, and here's what's wrong, and here's what I expect of you, is to hold the line and live the life. You guys see the big picture of where we're at? Now, we're rolling headfirst into this. We are, and, and, and when you begin to look at when you begin to look at, let's just look at Psalm 2. Go to Psalm, the second Psalm. Verse 1, it says, Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? Question. The kings of the earth set themselves. That's, who's the kings of the earth? Nations. And the rulers take counsel together. So here you have the kings of the earth and the rulers take counsel together. And we've, we've studied this before. The seven pillars of any society are family, uh, there's, there's government, there's education, there's commerce, there's arts and entertainment. Those are the rulers. So the rulers and the leaders of nations have taken counsel against, in other words, there's a conspiracy, against the Lord and against his anointed. Who's the anointed? Us. Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. So the true believers, I'm not talking about Christian denominations that have gone the way of Satan and allowed the sin in the pulpit, in their churches. I'm not talking about them because they're lost. I'm talking about those that have made Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior and live according to the word of God. Kings of the earth and the rulers are conspiring to break our bonds, which means to break us, the unity that we hold together, to break it apart, and to cast away our, the, our cords from them, I mean, meaning make us antisocial. We're not a part of society. We're outcast, right? And so they're counseling to do that now. They're counseling to take God out of everything. So you can go in and you can worship in any other religion, but dare not do it in Christianity. Why? The kings of the earth, the rulers of the earth, have taken counsel. Now, do you think they sat down and drew it out? It, 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 they don't even know what they're doing. They don't even know what they're doing. Because if they knew what they were doing, and they knew where they were going at the end of all this, they wouldn't do it. But that's why we have the term lost, right? They're lost, okay? So, but here's how God looks at it. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. What's he saying? This is ridiculous. I created you guys, and now, you know what? I'm going to throw you in the lake of fire. You're going to be eternally separate from me and everyone else, and you had your chance, right? He laughs. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath, 
and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king, Jesus, on my holy hill. You see the conspiracy? So this is where we're heading. I want you to know it's not going to get better. It is not going to get better. We can have some temporary relief. I believe that some of our elections in this nation have given us temporary relief. But the nonsense you're hearing and, and, and all of the thinking process that doesn't make any sense to you, like, you know, like they, they, they hate our nation. I mean, the, you, you, all of us are feeling that. That group will eventually have power. The difference is how much mercy will God give us here? Because it says all nations, all nations will come against us. Okay? Right now we can still come here and do this, right? And then he goes on. What does he do? He teaches us don't love the world or the things in the world, right? In fact, let's go, go to 1 John. First John 2. Verse 15 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, what is that saying? Is, you know, because when you think about it, you know, are we supposed to hate trees? Are we supposed to hate things? What, he, what, he, what, he, what he's doing here is he's saying, don't prioritize anything above me. If I'm your God, then, then, then everything, you don't worship anything else. You just worship me. He says, for if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, these are the three things that Eve and Adam did. It's not of the Father, it's the world. The world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Amen? So the will of God is the other side of loving the world here. Okay? So when you, when you look at what Adam did, is he went, or Eve did, is they went to gratify themselves. Make, they thought they can make themselves better by disobeying God. You follow? And that's what's happening in Romans chapter 1. Okay, so where we're heading is that we're going to live in a society that is so demented and so evil and, 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 the, and when it comes to biblical standards that it's going to be very difficult for those that aren't entrenched in God and his word to stand. That's why he said, you'll be persecuted for what my name's sake. Many will be offended in that day and betray many, right? Why? Because they don't know the truth about where we're headed. And they don't understand the truth. So as they make compromises along the way, they start drinking the Kool-Aid of the world. That's why once saved, always saved is so terrible. Because it says I can do anything I want. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says if you deny Jesus, you're going to hell in that time. When you're taking the mark of the beast, you go over to uh, Revelation 13. Revelation 13, verse 15. It says, And he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or their forehead so that no one may buy or sell except he who has the mark of the, of the name of the beast and the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let he who understands calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Okay, so what's he saying here? Think about this. Think about, okay, let's, let's take something in recent history. Let's, let's look at Hitler, okay? So Hitler comes to power and builds this great society. There was a middle class in Germany. They thrived. There was food on every table. I mean, he 
was a type and a shadow of all of the Antichrist kingdoms. Everybody in Germany was happy and prideful about their nation. And what did he do? He persecuted God's covenant people, right? So it's a good example in the modern era of what's coming. What he did was he marked everyone that belonged to God with the Star of David. He moved them into ghettos. That's where we get the word ghettos. Isolated them, cut their cords, made them outcasts, took their businesses, right? And everyone lived outside the ghetto in peace and harmony and great prosperity. But God's people were being abused and killed, right? Because they had a mark. Well, the opposite's going to happen from a marking standpoint in that everyone that belongs to Antichrist will swear allegiance to him. And for that swearing of allegiance, they'll deny Jesus. They're going to live, they're going to live with what Luke chapter 4 told us. They're going to live and say, all of this authority is mine, all the glory is mine, and I give it to whoever I want. So if you want to live in my great society and have freedom and wealth and prosperity, then you're going to swear your allegiance to me and deny Jesus Christ. And the people that take that mark will be evident and seen and will be able to buy and sell. And everyone that doesn't will be put in the ghetto. Okay? So how do you stand without first understanding and knowing what's going on? If you know what's going on, then you know there's an end to this. They didn't back then. They didn't know where it would end. If, if it starts happening to us, we know there's a clock running. We know it's going to happen. We know what they're going to do. Okay, that gives you the ability to have faith to live with the right frame of mind in the midst of a storm. And that's why this has to be preached. People have to know and understand what we're walking into. Because like a, you know, like a frog in water where you turn the heat on and it boils slowly, that's what's happening. And you got people, friends, cousins, relatives, making compromise. You know, uh, uh, growing marijuana. Uh, well, it's okay if a man and a man get married. You know, why? it's not our business. Yes, it is our business. It's our business when it's the law of the land and it's against the word of God. It is. So what do we do? I, my, my, the, the, the whole meaning for this word is to push in deeper. To push in deeper. And don't let money be your God. Uh, money, God, does God care about money? He, he doesn't care if you're wealthy. As long as you, Abraham was wealthy. The trouble is today we can't, separate between loving of wealth and loving of God. Abraham did. Remember the king wanted to give him, uh, every, after he gave Melchizedek uh, a tithe of all, the king wanted to give him things. He said, no, 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 I don't want anything from you because I don't want any man to ever say that a man made Abraham rich. It's only God. He knew who his provider was, amen? We need that. We need, we need to study the Bible. We need to understand the Bible. We need more Bible study, guys, because this is overwhelming us. I mean, we leave here, we got something, right? We leave here, and it starts hitting us before we get to uh, M59. I mean, you know, it's just that we're in this world that's moving away from God. And we have to, we have to plant our anchor where we're at. Amen? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time, this word. Father, we pray that it would not soon leave our hearts and minds, but you would continue to speak to us, Lord God, individually. Father, my prayer today, uh, Father, for our group here, both here and, and watching at home, is that, Father, we would be more sensitive to your voice than ever before, that we would know the voice of your spirit, and we ask, Father, that your word lives in our life, that your spirit would lead us and guide us and direct us, give us instruction, give us word of wisdom and word of knowledge. Lead us so that we can live a life that's pleasing to you and answer the purpose and call that you put on each one of us. 
Lord, we thank you, Father. We thank you. We bring up Mike uh, 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 Shimatero, who has a spine growth. Father, we just we come against it. We pray that it would dissipate in his body. We pray, Father, that he would not need surgery, Lord, that, but that, that this would dissipate and supernaturally leave, Father, as his family lays hands on him and curses this growth and commands it to leave his body, that he would have a testimony, Lord God, in his life. Lord, we give you glory, we give you praise, we give you honor. Father, we thank you for blessing us this day with your word, for giving us advance warning and knowledge and understanding that we can be used of you, Father, in this critical time ahead. Father, we love you, we thank you. Father, we thank you for mothers as we look at uh, tomorrow, Father, we just thank you for mothers, wives and mothers, Father, that have brought forth children into this earth. Father, we pray a blessing on those virtuous women that you've called, Father, to be leaders in, in our culture and our community. We give you glory and praise and honor, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. See you. I, I, we might get one more Saturday, and it won't be next week, but maybe the week after. So we'll see. It's just the schedule is very fluid.